Shenandoah County Historical Society. And I wanna welcome all of you to the 2021 Shenandoah County Heritage Day uh, brought to you by the Shenandoah County Historical Society and the uh, Shenandoah County Library's Truven Archives. Things are a little bit different this year. They have been, haven't they, for the whole <clears throat> past year. Um, we wanna thank you for taking the time to join us via Zoom and Facebook to learn more about our county's rich history. And I'd like to, uh, we'd like to know where you're joining us, if you're joining us from beyond the Shenandoah Valley. We think we hopefully we'll have some visitors from far away and you could leave that information in the Zoom, uh, Zoom chat or the um, Facebook comments. I think I am going to hand this back over to Zach Hoddle, who's the Shenandoah County Archivist. He has a few technical announcements to make. All right. So hello, everyone. Um, welcome to Heritage Day. Um, there's just a few technical things we'll need to go over really fast. Um, number one, I will be here if there are any uh, questions or anything that you need uh, answered. Um, number two, everyone should be on mute uh, throughout the presentation. Um, so if you need anything, you have any questions or anything, please put them in the chat, which is at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you have any questions, uh, be sure to drop them in the chat. And what will happen is I will pick those up and then add them or ask the presenter the questions at the end. Um, and then once we are done, everyone will just go back to the main room where you just were before you came in here. And then we will uh, start the next presentation um, about 10 minutes after this one ends and we'll go into a separate breakout room. Uh, but like I said, if you have any questions, just drop them in the chat and I will be here. So you're up, Barbara. Thank you, Zach. Um, I am here to introduce our first speaker, uh, John Adamson, who was going to do a presentation on our historic barns and agricultural legacy. Um, John was born and raised in Arlington, Virginia, and he has degrees from Virginia Tech and from the University of Richmond. After 30 years of a career in telecommunications, uh, we, yes, he, he's my husband, we moved to Strasburg in 1998 and we have two children and three grandchildren. Um, both of us have always enjoyed history, uh, but once we got here, we quickly became immersed in local history. Uh, John is on the board of the Shenandoah County Historical Society. He's uh, also a board member and an active volunteer at Belgrove Plantation uh, in our neighboring Frederick County. For anyone who doesn't live here, you might not know that. He's involved in other community organizations, of course. He writes a regular column in the Historical Society's quarterly newsletter that usually focuses on a historic house in Shenandoah County, but barns have long been in the background. And I think the idea percolated for a long time with him to do some kind of study of barns. And he began the barn documentation program about three years ago and has so far documented more than 270. I can't keep up with it. I know he will tell you more. And um, this project has taken him and sometimes me and his, uh, his barn project team to many interesting and beautiful places in Shenandoah County. And he's met some wonderful people. Um, I, the background on our computers changed, changes a lot. You know, he always has a new photograph to, to put on the home page, and that's kind of fun. Um, and this morning, he is going to discuss Shenandoah County agriculture and, of course, barns. John? Wow. Um, thank you very much, Barbara. Um, welcome, everybody. Let's uh, get going. We've got some fun things to do and lots of barn pictures to see. I'm going to share my screen and we'll, um, we'll get going.
Okay. Um, I thought it, to talk about barns, it would be fun to put them in context. Uh, these barns are all Shenandoah County. Shenandoah County, as you know, is a um, well-known, um, let's get this going the right way, a well-known agricultural place and um, uh, barns have been very, very important since the very beginning of Shenandoah County's history. And um, so fortunately for us, we have the um, Morrison archives and we have some wonderful photographs of uh, agriculture in Shenandoah County in the, in the years gone by. And I wanna share some of those. This is not advancing. And we're gonna see that the, a lot of the agriculture centers around grain and that's um, an important element of the agriculture um, in the county and how barns were built and used. So I'm gonna just start by getting right to that and show you where the fertile soils of the county are, the green you see on the map there of the county and some statistics about uh, wheat production in various years in the past, always a big, um, product well up into the era of the Second World War. The little black dots on that map are grist mills in 1885. And you can see what an important element of um, county uh, agriculture and really the entire economy of the county grain um, growing and production was. Um, so let's take a look at how that looked about a hundred years ago, more or less from the Morrison collection. This is great fun. And um, I'm going to. You're going to see that there are um, there are bank barns in some of these pictures, and we're going to look at a lot of barns. But a, a agricultural scene from the 1910 or 20 period would have a house and a barn and chickens in the yard and outbuildings. Um, certainly, uh, one of the big elements of local agriculture was orchards, and um, we have a couple views of orchards and orchard production. The apple industry ha has been important, um, very labor intensive, um, everything done manually, um, so no machines, um, a big part of the county's economic scene. And in fact, um, orchard work and uh, production and packing of um, orchard products was one of the um, employment opportunities for women a hundred years ago, and you see a bunch of them at the peach orchard here. Um, but of course, uh, mostly we were talking about um, more traditional crops, uh, grains and, and plowing and everything done by uh, animal powered, um, even though it was using the machines and technology, typically they were animal powered. Here's a cornfield, probably one of the neatest cornfields you'll ever see after harvest about a hundred years ago. Agriculture continued through the winter time. Um, they couldn't stop just because it snowed. I think here we're gathering forage for animals. Um, it's interesting when you look at these old photos to notice how intricate the harnessing is for the horses and mules. So you might just pay attention to that in the next few slides. Um, another important part of Shenandoah County agriculture has always been poultry. We've got the chicken or maybe turkey. I think they're chicken crates piled up on this wagon. And again, drawn by two horses, uh, well harnessed. And when I go around to barns, I see these old harnesses sometimes hanging in the barn still to, to this day. Um, because we are German in our uh, descent in large part, we find a lot of pork and, and uh, you know that the uh, annual practice of slaughtering hogs in the fall time was very common. It may still be in some corners of the county. And we see that in the Morrison photographs. Every farm had a cow or two to milk. Um, here we, mom has the cow and the calf out in the yard. Um, and beef cattle were also a part of the agricultural scene. The uh, barns of Shenandoah County uh, had stalls for these animals. Um, here's a manure spreader in the field with a four horse team. So that's a mechanical thing, but still uh, horse powered. We don't find 
tractors as we know them today until just before World War II and, and in the period afterward. And while you look at this and you see the mule and the family and the intricate harness, don't ignore the fully loaded hay wagon in the barn behind um, the uh, people and the animal in this picture. That is a very important element of barns and their use. And I suspect this animal just pulled that wagon into the barn before this photo was taken. Um, these horses uh, look to me, I'm not a farmer, but to me, these look more like carriage or riding horses than draft horses for agri heavy agricultural work. Speaking of which, here's a binder, a machine being pulled by a team of horses. It cuts the wheat and binds the wheat into shocks that are dumped out of the right side of the binder. Um, in the Mims Bottom area, which is maybe the most fertile place in the county, or at least one of the largest open fields, we see four binders at once with the wheat um, shocks being carefully stacked. They stay in the field for about 30 days to dry and then be gathered up um, to be threshed, or as we like to say in Shenandoah County, thrashed. Um, if you had been in Shenandoah County in the early part of the 1900s, this scene would have been everywhere in August. Here we see uh, wheat sh uh, shocks carefully stacked in the field drying. This is still Mims Bottom. And, and uh, another example of the very same scene, imagine the golden piles all around the county at harvest time. Note the barn in the background. Um, and I, it just, this is what, this is what we were doing as our primary economic activity in this county early in the 20th century. Eventually these get gathered up, loaded into the wagon. Here we see how, just how full a wagon can be. Imagine the two horses pulling this fully loaded wagon over to the barn or the place where the threshing will occur. Here is a traction engine, a steam powered, um, device that has a big flywheel that will power the threshing machine, which is being towed behind the traction engine. And it will be set up either in the barn or nearby to thresh the wheat. It's, the wheat is actually forked into this big machine and it, um, the machine th thrashes the wheat and separates the grain by, with a series of sifters and blows the wheat, the uh, straw and chaff out into oh, these right. huge piles. Here's great big piles of straw. Here's wheat still to be threshed. And uh, this scene was just um, east of Strasburg in 1908. You see the traction engine and the long belt that runs the threshing machine that's kind of hidden behind the wheat pile. Um, a different way of setting it up was to put the traction engine outside the barn and send the long uh, belt into the threshing machine in the barn with the crew of people to do the actual loading and threshing um, uh, of the wheat or other grain. Um, sometimes it was a smaller scale. Here's a little one cylinder um, engine, but it's, again, it has a belt to drive a, small, a smaller threshing machine. When this work was done, the pile of straw could be as big as the barn. And you see an example of that here. This is just south of Mount Jackson. So um, I'm showing you a little bit about the, the barns themselves. Now we're gonna look at those. Um, I, ca I call these historic barns and, and that's my usage. Uh, historic means local design materials and construction. Uh, and that happens until about 1950 when more national um, structures start to be, uh, and we lose our kind of local distinction. Um, so when I survey barns, I only look for what I call historic barns. Um, and as you see here, a barn performs three basic functions. We've sort of alluded to them already. Um, hay storage, fodder storage, animal stalls, and crop processing and storage. Um, my survey, some of the things there, but um, it says 270 barns documented to date. I think it's now 280. And my guess is that's about half of the historic barns in Shenandoah County. So I've got more work to do.
Um, well, let's talk about barns a little bit. There are two forms that we typically find in Shenandoah County, ground barns and bank barns. Those are the two forms. And there are two construction um, methods. One is log construction and the other is timber frame construction. And you see here that the bank barn is the most common form and the timber frame construction method is the most common method. So timber frame bank barns in the lower right are the most common sort of barn we would find today, historic barn in Shenandoah County. Although we do find the others, the log barns are getting rarer and rarer because they're so old typically. Um, and the timber frame barns, uh, excuse me, the ground barns are often found on smaller farms. Um, and we'll see a few examples of those as well. Um, and I, when I do my program, I always tell everybody, if you don't learn one thing, if you only learn one thing, please learn the word forebay. And so the forebay is the part that sticks out on a bank barn. <clears throat> the bank is on the back side. The animal entrance is in the lower level. This is the front of the barn. And the forebay sticks out. And when you drive around Shenandoah County and you see that part that juts out, you can tell your friends, that's a Shenandoah County four bay bank barn and they'll all be impressed. Think of your forehead, maybe four bay. Um, you, you, you will fail the test if you don't remember that. Um, <laughs> this barn form came to us from Pennsylvania by German speaking people who came from parts of Switzerland and Germany uh, with their architecture. They can in large numbers to Philadelphia in the early middle 18th century, the good land was quickly taken up in Pennsylvania and they moved south and west into what's now into the Shenandoah Valley and they brought their barn architecture and material culture with them. And um, that's why we have so many in Shenandoah County to this day. And here's a map showing that dispersion of this form of barn, this Pennsylvania barn. And the red star is, of course, Shenandoah County. And you can see the very dense part where the barns first appeared and then where they were uh, built in massive numbers into the Shenandoah Valley. But, but, and then as the German settlers, the Germanic settlers moved west, scattered um, uh, examples of these barns exist all the way out into the mid Midwest and even into Canada. But I can tell you, if you cross the Blue Ridge Mountains to the east, you will not see the Four Bay Bank Barn. You will see um, Yankee Barns and what I call English Barns. It's really a Shenandoah Valley th um, thing. So here we're gonna look quickly at some log barns, just the kind of, what is a log barn? Well, here's an example. They typically have two cribs, that is squares. Um, here's another one that has two squares of logs and a roof over the two combined. That's pretty typical. If that doesn't make sense to you, you could build one on your dining room table pretty easily. Get your Lincoln log set out, build two squares, add a little gallery, put a roof over the whole thing, and you have a two crib log, in this case, ground barn. Um, the other construction method that I mentioned is timber frame barns, and these have uh, framing inside that holds up the roof. And here we see that framing, this, this framing set of, it's called a bent. That's the name of this structural element. And they go across the barn and there's usually four, sometimes five and the longer the barn, the more bents it has inside. We'll see some more as we look through. Um, they are joined with mortise and tenon joinery. Here we see the pins that hold the, um, the two pieces together. Uh, there's a tab that sticks out of this one and a hole in this one. And we can see that a little better in the next one where I found a barn where the pin had come out and the um, joint had separated. So this brace has a tenon which fits into the mortise of the piece above. And when it's in there very, very nice and tight, a pin is driven in and um, holds the joint together. So mortise and tenon with pins or pegs, that's just typical of a Shenandoah County timber frame barn. Um, the way these barns are built, the timber frame barns are built, the bents are the 
the foundation and first floor of the barn is built. And then the timbers for the bents are gathered and put together flat on the ground um, near, I mean, on the first floor and then raised with manual effort and pushed up. And, and so I said, some barns have four bents, some have six. Here you see the second bent going up. The first one's already in place, temporarily held up. The next bents are put together and ready to go after this one gets up. And you see a large crew of people doing this. Um, and in fact, that's the way it was done. Um, we, in Shenandoah County, the barn raising was a big deal and it was fun um, to learn some about this. Um, we found recently a diary page was shared with me it named 37 men who helped put up a barn in 1928, just east of Maurytown. They had fine luck and everything fit up fine and tight. Um, They're talking about the joinery. Um, I interviewed Noah Dellinger, who some of you heard of or hopefully knew, and he talked about his own barn raising in 1938 and shared a couple of pictures from that with me, including a, a, this group of people enjoying the midday dinner. And Noah, Noah said, in those days, people helped people, never thought about pay. So the pay was the big dinner at the middle of the day and the help you got when you needed to raise your barn. Um, and that's the way it was done. Uh, Zach found a couple examples in old newspapers, very same thing, Shenandoah County, 1926, the Spitzer barn, 1929, the Fadley barn, uh, who the master builder was, and in each case named all the people who helped, including the women and children who helped with the meal and served it. So um, this was a big tradition of community helping each other, um, a wonderful thing in the past, and um, I look for somebody to share more of these stories with me. Um, so let's go on and look at some barns. Uh, this, is, this is my survey work. So here's a wonderful log barn, uh, bank barn, the bank on the right side, the four bay here on the left side in this image. And I'm gonna just say a word about dates. In this case, circa 1791, if I put a circa and a question mark, that tells you in looking at this program that I'm very uncertain about the date of this barn. Um, I've learned from some detailed investigations that barn dates are harder to estimate than I initially thought. Barns give us a lot of clues with tool marks and construction methodologies and oral histories and even occasionally some dates written in the barns, but all of those things together are not certain. And it's rare to be absolutely certain about the date of a barn. So you're going to see this sort of uh, nomenclature um, as we look through, through some more barns. Um, here's another log barn, and it's covered in metal, so you wouldn't necessarily know. But when you go inside, you see one of those cribs and the president of the Shenandoah County Historical Society. And um, that's a, a typical interior of a um, log barn today. Here's another pretty famous one near Psalmsville. Um, in this case, we actually were able to perform dendroarchaeology. I won't explain that except to say it's the science of using tree rings in the logs that compose the barn to learn when the logs were cut down. And in this case, they were cut down in 1841. And so that tells us the barn was almost certainly built in 1842. Um, it's quite a science, quite an interesting process, and uh, we're lucky to be able to do that on a few of our barns. Here's the interior of that same barn, one of the cribs, um, joined with V-notch joinery, which is what you find in Shenandoah County. Another two crib log barn, very much like um, uh, the, the survivors we find in other places. Hey, John? I hate to interrupt, the slides aren't advancing. We're not seeing your latest slides. Okay. Um, it's still I, on I, the diary page. John, are they advancing on your computer? Yes, yes. Oh dear. Um, okay. Um, so try stopping the screen share and restarting it. Okay. I'm sorry about that. Let's see what happens.
Um, so I need some feedback to tell me where I am. It, it's, so it's working now, it's on the Jadwin Road Barn. Okay, well, um, I'm, I'm just gonna go on. I, I appreciate you the, um, learning about that. I'm sorry it occurred, but this is virtual reality. <laughs> That's uh, life in 2021 in COVID. Um, so here's the log barn covered in metal. Here's the interior of that barn. Is everybody with me now? Zach, is that working? We So we're on um, the log barn in Lebanon Church in 1810. Uh, it's still not advancing. It's... Um, um, ooh. We okay. see, I see you moving. Well, um, I'm on a log ground barn in, on Bolivar Road. Is that what you're seeing on your That's screen? what we're seeing now, yes. Okay. Um, would you keep, uh, just let me know, I'm going to advance to the next slide. Did that work? Yeah, we're, there's a picture of the Bolivar Road log barn with the dog in the picture. In the interior. Okay, so it seems to be working. Um, well, uh, first time for, you know, three, we get these technical glitches. So here we see two cribs in a log barn interior with the roof above. Um, other log barns and this log barn uh, also on J. Edwin Road, not the one we saw before. And when we look at the next one, it almost looks like the very same barn. I'm going to go back and forth. But in fact, they're two different barns and it just shows you that there was some consistency in um, the architectural elements at that time. These barns are probably in the early 19th century. Um, here's an interior view of the last barn with some uh, damage visible to, to the old barn. And in fact, I went back to it recently and it has collapsed. So this is the sad story of barns for which um, expensive maintenance can't be performed. Um, eventually, however, log barns gave way to timber frame barns. This particular one is actually a sort of combination of both construction methodologies. And um, when I go inside, I turn to the right and see a log crib. But if I turn to the left, I see a timber frame, a bent. And so this barn has both um, construct construction methodologies under one roof. And we found a, um, a couple barns like that, but then it, they transitioned pretty much entirely to timber frame barns. This is another one for which we did uh, dendro archaeology and found that this barn was built in 1811, but significantly rebuilt with new materials in about 1868. So it probably um, was torn down almost to the foundation and rebuilt about 1868. Um, and now we're just going to look at pictures of barns. This is fun stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you that there are no two same in these pictures. They're all different barns in Shenandoah County. I've seen 280 barns. I got lots of pictures to share. Um, and uh, you're going to think it's times. No, you already showed me that one. Um, but no, I haven't. They're all different, but they do have a sameness to them. That's a lot of fun. Um, and part of our uh, legacy really. Uh, barns often have a granary inside a small room in the corner where the grain was stored after threshing and the uh, farmers uh, um, at times wrote down the threshing information in pencil. They used stroke marks to count bushels and things like that. And I learned it as I did the survey, always look hard in the, in the granary to see if there's this sort of barn graffiti because it actually tells you something about um, the agricultural product productivity of the time. So here we have a threshing report from this farm in 1929. Um, and I'm again, we were just looking at some pretty barns all, all across the county. Another good four bay bank barn. That four bay sticking out in space without any posts holding it up, cantilevered. That barn was made of white oak, which is stout, the, the, kind of the preferred. Uh, material and here's uh, a view under that very same barn. You see the white oak and the hand hewn axe marks on it. Um, just uh, probably 160 or 80 years old, still standing strong. Here's a barn that has several additions to it. Um, 
If we go around to the front and look up, we see that the floor joists in this barn have notches in them, which tells me they were reused from some old log building that was torn down. Shenandoah County farmers are nothing if not pragmatic, and if they can reuse material, they do. So here's an example of that. And this is one of the things that makes dating a barn just by looking at the pieces a little um, fishy at times. You just have to be wary about everything you see. Um, more examples of great barns in Shenandoah County, all different. The, um, when I meet the people that own them, they're excited to tell me about their barns. They, uh, they, a lot of them have spent a lot of time and effort to keep the barns in good condition. Um, it's a wonderful thing all around the county. In this case, I'm standing on the site of a barn that was burned in, during the Civil War. And the barn in the picture was rebuilt, was built immediately after the war. Um, so we're pretty sure about the date of this barn. Um, inside, we can see in that particular barn a good example of one of the bents. They're hard to take pictures of because they're so big, and when you get in the barn, it's hard to see the whole thing. Um, here's our here's round bales in a square barn, but um, locally, people do the best they can to use their barns to continue to use their barns for agriculture. You notice probably that many of the barns that are in these photos are covered in metal. Um, of course, their siding was originally wooden. Um, but I've come to uh, understand that that metal siding will preserve a barn. And I, uh, while I love the look of the old wood, if it's covered in metal, I think that's probably a good thing. Uh, it preserves the barn. This barn has a, a added shed on the bank side, a feature you don't see very often in Shenandoah County. Um, you might find that in other places. Uh, barns aren't all red, but um, many of them are. And um, here's just, you know, we're going to, you know, as I said, these barns are all um, different. Here's one so modernized and extended and covered in metal, it's a little hard to see. You have to go inside to really get a uh, look at the bones of the barn. And I went into the granary here and found this little bit of graffiti. The kids must have gotten onto the scale that the farmer had to weigh his feed and weighed each other and wrote it on the wall. So that's, it's fun to think about July 28th, 1903 and the, and the five kids entertaining themselves in the barn. Um, and we're moving through time. You see the dates, the guesstimated dates up here. This barn has an eight foot four bay um, sticking out in space, still standing strong and square. Um, this barn, not so much. There's an added shed to it uh, on the backs of the four bay scene here. Um, I went into this barn on a windy day, an old barn and the roof rattling and the timber shaking and a very um, interesting moment. Um, more barns. Again, I'm telling you, these are no two are the same. This barn, uh, we're inside, we see the bent, and here's the granary in this particular barn, a small room and tucked away in one of the corners. Um, and those two barns are different from one another, but they look quite similar. This one still uses gravity from the floor above. There's openings and the grain and the feed is dumped in and the gravity feeds it into the bin at the bottom. This is uh, one of the advantages of a two-level barn. Um, and one reason they were built that way. And we just see this over and over. This is how it was in Shenandoah County. This one still has its hay fork, the device used to lift the hay and, and fill the ends of the barn called the hay mouths with hay and several people have said, oh yeah, we filled it all the way to the ceiling. Um, they knew how much hay it took to feed how many animals over the course of a winter. And um, the barns were generally sized to accommodate the farm they needed to serve. And so we keep seeing more barns that have a very similar look. You know you're in the Shenandoah Valley when you see barns like this. Even up until 1947, one of the last barns built, 
um, uh, unposted four bay bank barn. Of course, all these barns took an awful lot of wood. So here's an old sawmill and the, from the same Lakes Atlas of 1885, all these black dots are sawmills that were in, in use in 1885 in Shenandoah County. And of course, it wasn't just barns being built with wood. It was virtually every building, houses, stores, everything. And so um, sawing and, and the production of timber and lumber was a huge industry. Um, take a quick look at some ground barns. Uh, I didn't mean to go quite that fast. Hopefully, Zach, everybody's seeing the advanced slides now. Um, this barn looks a lot like a four bay bank barn, but if you walk around to the other side, you see there's no four bay. It's on the ground, and a, and a ground barn typically has um, stalls on each side of the center aisle with hay mows above. Um, it's actually my, my team of helpers helping to measure this barn. Um, thank you, those folks. Another ground barn here, you can see um, the hay mow above and the stalls below, slightly different from a four bay bank barn. This one we saw recently, and because the side has sort of fallen off of it, you can see the interior better, but it is a ground barn. There's no wagon access to this upper level. If anything's gonna be put up there, it has to be lifted. Uh, in this, and of course, anything would be hay typically. Um, some uh, statistics from the work I've done. I've, uh, it says 270 barns, but now it's 280, but I haven't updated this slide. It doesn't, the numbers don't change much in terms of average size, condition, um, et cetera, what you see here. Um, but I guess maybe the, the thing to, one thing to note is that only less than, slightly less than half of the barns are still in what I consider to be agricultural use. So that suggests a threat to their existence. Um, and it's not a surprise, I think, but um, uh, I think generally farmers try to make the best use of their old barns if they can. But if um, the land has been uh, subdivided and there's not really a farm there anymore, then the barn um, can't really be useful for agriculture. People do whatever they can to maintain them and use them for other purposes. So uh, as I'm getting near the end of the program, I wanna just show a few pictures of then and now. So when I survey a barn sometimes, the owners have an old picture, in this case from about 1893, and then here's the same barn today. Um, and I'll just go back so you can see, yep, it looks pretty much the same. It's 130 years old. Here's another one for an old picture from the 1900 sort of time frame. This barn was extended on the right side in this picture, and here it is today, a little longer than the previous picture, but still, still here. This barn, the, the uh, photograph was documented as 1879. I couldn't get the same angle, but I did get a picture of the barn today, still here. Um, the famous one on South Middle Road from the 1920s or so, and that barn that hardly has changed. Um, this barn on Ridgely Road, still exists, there it is today. I'll go back to this barn over here and st still standing right on the road as it was a hundred years ago. Here's a timber frame barn being built. This is the county farm, um, one of the last traditional barns and you notice it's not really being raised by a big crew, they're using mechanical means. So that sort of is a signature of the end of the era of, uh, barn raising, but you can clearly see the bents in this case because the roof hasn't been added yet. And here's the barn today, still in service at the county farm. And yours truly, this is the barn Barbara and I own. And here's Arch Hoover with his animals in front of the barn. And here's the barn today. You see a different form of transportation. Um, from when the barn was built. We found a date of 1918 in this barn, and I think that's probably right. It's a little ground barn. And um, to close, I'm just gonna do a couple of um, 
before and after pictures. Uh, I, I mentioned that barns are threatened by uh, maintenance problems and so forth, but barn owners love their barns and they do good things when they can. In this case, the barn was entirely painted and, and I know this barn well because it's right across the road from where I live and now it looks fabulous. Other barns that have been um, carefully and lovingly maintained and worked on by their owners. I'm gonna just show a few more examples. And here's one, it wasn't in that bad a shape, but now it's, it's gonna last way beyond the life of all of us looking at this program today. Great barn. Uh, here's one of my favorite barns. Um, it's probably a pre-Civil War barn. It's looking a little, uh, a little sad in this photograph with some obvious maintenance issues. And that barn owner is working on it hard to this day, um, taking care of it so it'll last a long time. Um, here's, here's a barn that was literally falling down in this image. The left side of the barn was ready to collapse. The owner did, um, did tear that part down, but then restored and repaired the rest of it. So here's how it looks today um, and ready to last um, another hundred years or more. Um, here's a barn west of Woodstock. You see a lot of deterioration, some loose stones in the foundation. Um, big, big barn, took a lot major effort and today it looks great. Um, so it's really encouraging to see barn owners take their time and spend the money and um, care for their barns. Uh, this is a, one of the biggest barns in Shenandoah County being repaired as I surveyed it. And here's the four bay with no posts as built. But today that barn, when he repaired the barn, he posted the four bay so it wouldn't sag anymore. It looks great today. Um, and I just leave you with this sort of uh, open-ended question, you know, what, what would our county be without its barns, you know? Um, when I drive around and see things like this or like this, I just think uh, we're fortunate to be here and um, we should respect, enjoy and love our barns. So I say thank you very much for listening. And uh, that's what I have to share today. Sorry about the technical difficulties, but um, that, that's, uh, that happens. It wouldn't have happened 100 years ago, 120 years ago. Um, so, uh, Zach, I'm, I'm at the end of my um, program, and I'm happy to, to respond to any questions, if there are any. And um, if not, um, I'll just show this briefly for anybody who's interested in learning more about barns. You can go on the website for the Historical Society, and I have a map that shows all 280 barns that I've surveyed. And I'm always available via email. If anybody wants to share a barn that they think I haven't surveyed and want me to come see it, I like to do that. Um, or just talk about barns. I, you get me started, Barbara knows if I start talking about barns, I, she, she's gonna be, it, I'm gonna go on until somebody says, John, be quiet. Um, so. Um, so John, there is one question um, okay. from Karen Wetzel. Uh, she said that there was a presentation at the New Market Area Library a couple of years ago about silos, and she wanted to know um, how many barns you found with silos, um, similar to one you've had on the picture. Yeah, um, and thank you, Karen. And there, you see silos at many barns. Um, silos come and go. The silos were st first um, introduced in the barn uh, into agriculture locally about 1880. And they were not as well built as the barns, but often were torn down and replaced by more modern silos. Um, and at, at the end of the barn's life, sometimes the silo remains because it was a good last silo and the barn's been torn down. So if you see a silo standing out in the field by itself, you can almost bet that there was a barn right there at one time. Um, so uh, silos and barns don't necessarily get built at the same time, but it is a more efficient way to store fodder and uh, especially fodder, mixed hay and other uh, animal feed. Um, and they usually have an access tunnel or port at the bottom to allow the um, farmer to get the 
silage out of the silo and into the lower level of the barn? Great question. Um, not every barn has a silo, but every silo had a barn, more or less. Okay, anything else? Yeah, if, does anyone else have any other questions? To Oh, we do have one more that just came in. Um, uh, question, is there a particular feature of a Switzer barn? S-W-I-T-Z-E-R? Yeah, oh, yeah, this is, uh, somebody's been studying their barns. I like that. A Switzer barn is kind of an early form of a, of a four bay bank barn. And um, uh, it has an asymmetrical roof line. The, instead of um, the roof being symmetrical, like the one in the bottom of the screen right now, where the, um, the roof is centered above the foundation. So the top would be off a little bit and the side on the four bay is longer. The roof is longer. Um, and that, that's the way the first um, Pennsylvania four bay bank barns were built. But it turned out to be a little awkward because the wall on the four bay side is not very high. And eventually they decided um, it was more practical to center the roof over the whole barn, not just over the foundation. So I'm a little, being a little technical, but the big thing about the Swisser barn is it's early and it has an asymmetrical roof line. All right, I do not see any other questions. Um, you can, if anyone has any, you can drop them in the chat or I did put uh, the email for the Historical Society and the Historical Society website in the chat. Um, so you can certainly reach out to John or learn more about his project there. Um, and what I'm gonna do then, I'm gonna turn it back over to Barbara to wrap us up for this session. And then we will leave the breakout room and uh, get ready for the next one. Thanks, Zach. And thank you, John, for a great presentation. I also learned something new, believe it or not, every time I see his presentations. Um, it, was, it was great, it was terrific. And I wanna thank everybody who attended um, on behalf of the Shenandoah County Historical Society and the Shenandoah County Library. Uh, we encourage you to attend our, our upcoming sessions if you can. And the next one is going to be uh, vintage recipes and eating patterns. But uh, before I forget, uh, Please mark your calendars for April 2022. 2022 is um, going to be Shenandoah County's 250th birthday. So there will be many different activities over that year and we'll have a very special Heritage Day in April of 2022 to commemorate that really um, in important time. And there'll be more information on a 250 website that will be upcoming. And you'll also be able to find out more on our website, uh, schs1795.com. And you can follow us on Facebook, Facebook at schsva. So I will turn this back over to Zach because we know that we're gonna have people who, who may tune in for one session and they can't they won't be here for all the sessions. So Zach is going to do his, his technical thing. Um, 